Your house, savings, and retirement is at risk. How does the U.S. national debt impact you? Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode at Nova Rice Invest, your channel for financial education. Today, I'm going to talk about the national debt. And I know I'm a little bit late in the game, and I know people have been talking about this for quite some time, but to be honest, I wasn't truly understanding what was the big deal. Yes, and I understand I invest in real estate and I went to school to study business. But to be honest, I was never able to draw the correlation between what happened at a national level, in this case, at a macro level, and how did it impact me at a personal level because I was too focused on doing the how-to. I was too focused on learning all the how-tos and how to make it happen. But then I realized that if I focus on the how-tos and I forget about the whys and I fail to understand why certain things happen or why certain things keep repeating over and over again, I am going to be doomed and condemned to be ignorant forever. And we don't want to do that. You certainly don't want to do that. Otherwise, you wouldn't be tuning into this episode. So in today's episode, what we're going to do, we're going to go over the details of the national debt and help you realize that you're not separate from the U.S. national debt. In fact, all of us are so intertwined and are so connected to the U.S. national debt to the point that we couldn't even imagine. And that puts us at a very high risk because we're given control of our money to other people who basically we cannot control. We cannot tell them what to do. So once again, I'm going to go over the details of the national debt. I'm going to show you how connected you are to the national debt and what you can do to protect your money in the event that the U.S. default and the national debt. So let's get started. Before we start, let me remind you to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications button. Okay, first thing first, I'm going to draw a line here. And on one side, we're going to look at the U.S. national debt currently exceeding the 30 trillion. And this was an article from February 1st, 2022, when the U.S. national debt exceeded the 30 trillion dollar for the first time. So we have U.S. national debt, 30 trillion, right? And then there's you. And what you have is your net worth. Now, let's get into the nitty gritty to show you that you are no different than the national debt. Everyone is the same. And here's why. So what does a country produce, right? So there's the GDP, which stands for gross domestic product. And it's basically what the country generates in terms of money. So according to Investopedia, the concept of GDP stands for the total monetary or market value of all the finished goods and services produced within a country's border. How does the GDP translate to you as an individual? Well, your GDP is your income and it can come from your salary. It can come from any side gigs that you have. Or um, it could also come from a part-time job that you may have. So in other words, it is basically how you make money. So there you go. The U.S. makes money through its GDP by creating goods and services and selling them. And you create money through your income. And now let's just talk about the expenses. So what kind of expenses that the U.S. have? So, well, there is the Social Security. There is Medicare. We also have Medicaid. There's also any treasury or bond interest that they have to pay out, et cetera, and so many other things, right? And then on the personal side, your expenses will be what? So we have rent or mortgage, depending on where you are financially in your life. There are groceries that you need to cover. There's also bills so call it electricity call it your cell phone netflix why not and yada 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 right so what happens with this right so i'm just gonna draw a quick line here is that depending on how the country manages their money or how you manage your money you can end up with a surplus or a deficit right so what makes a country have a surplus so if your GDP is higher than the expenses of the country, then you end up with a surplus. So on America values, let's say, for example, the U.S. generates $30 trillion, right, in GDP, and it spends $28 trillion. 
And that will leave the country with a surplus of $2 trillion, right? So that's good. When you move it in your case, it's kind of like the same, right? So let's say, for example, your income, it's more than your expenses. So that means in your case, you will also have a personal positive surplus. And putting an numerical example, let's say you have $5,000, that's your income on a monthly basis, and you spend $4,000. So that means you will have a surplus of $1,000 that you can use it to travel, or you can put it towards your savings or investment, yada, yada, right? You choose what to do with that money. However, if the roles reverse, let's say, for example, a country generates a certain amount of GDP that is not enough to cover the expenses of that country because they're too high, now the country is at a deficit. So let's say, for example, we have a country with a GDP that generates 20 trillion, but the expenses on that country is 50 trillion. So now we're talking about a $30 trillion deficit, okay? So that's the true definition of a deficit. And on the personal side, you're no more different. So when did you wind up with a deficit, right? So it happens when your income is not enough to keep up with your expenses because they're too high. So let's just reverse the numbers and let's say your income is $4,000, but you're spending $5,000. So now you have a deficit of $1,000 a month in this example, right? So what happens when a country or you wind up on a deficit? So deficit US, and then we're gonna write here deficit you, right? So when a country goes into a deficit, it has various ways to, you know, reduce the deficit. And one of them is by raising taxes to bring in more revenue to bring up the GDP. Um, that's likely not going to happen because no politician will prefer to raise taxes because they want to be elected for a second term. Uh, the other way to take care of a deficit is by lowering uh, the expenses of cutting on expenses. Uh, once again, no politician is going to do that because once again, they want to get reelected for a second term and no one is willing to cut out social security funds or Medicare and stuff like that. Um, the third way, which is kind of ironic, um, is to just simply print more money and um, just fund whatever they want to fund. And uh, the fourth one is by issuing debt in the form of bonds, right? So uh, bonds are basically, once again, debt that um, gets sold to investors and to the public. Uh, in exchange, uh, those investors or the public will receive interest. So the money that the government collects from those investors, um, it's considered uh, money raising. It's how the government raises money to continue to fund deficit spending, right? Uh, another way to look at it is that bonds are a form of borrowing uh, in order to keep you know, generating money. How does that translate to you on the personal side? So, well, if you're in a deficit, you have a couple of choices, right? So you can get another job, right? Or another side gig, so you can generate more money. Uh, that means you will have to work a lot more. Two, you're gonna have to cut down on expenses. Uh, so no more Netflix for you, no more going out, no more of the latest iPhone, yada, yada. Uh, you definitely cannot print money, so that's not even going to go in there. And your next option is to create some type of personal bond, um, but you cannot do that. So the best way to create some type of a solution that is very similar to a bond is to go into credit card debts, right? So credit card debts are a form uh, of you raising funds, right? So you go to a bank and you sign an IOU paper and you say, hey, I need this amount of dollar in the form of a credit card. And as long as you keep receiving money, you will be able to afford the lifestyle that you want. Shocking, isn't it? I didn't realize that until I started reading more into it and I realized, hey, this is unfair. 
how is it possible that the government can do whatever it wants, print money, and then issue bonds and stuff like that, and they get to make money. But then us, the people, in our case, all our options are, you know, no better than others. Work more, live less, or just simply drown yourself in debt, right? And in this example in particular, I'm talking about bad debt, not good debt. So if you are interested in learning about the difference, here's an episode that you can check out uh, after this one, of course, where you can learn more about good versus bad debt. Now that you know that your personal debt situation is no different than the national debt, let's proceed with understanding or learning about who actually owns the debt of 30 trillion. So we have this nice, you know, pie here. And I'm just going to break things down so you can see who owns what. So this chunk over here, it's owned by Intergovernment Holdings. And in a minute, I'll explain what that is. And this big chunk over here is debt held by the public. Okay, so keep that in mind because we're going to need more space. So the small chunk right here, it's going to be intergovernment holding. And the big chunk right down here is debt held by the public. Okay, so let's just break things down. And I have here the debt by the public. And I have here intergovernment debt or holdings, whatever they want to call it, right? So let's just start over here. Let's just give you the background the, about this. Why would the government lend money to other departments within the government? It is very simple because of the Social Security Trust Fund. OK, so it turns out, as I was doing my research, that the Social Security generates a lot of revenue from your payroll taxes, from your paychecks. If you don't believe me, feel free to take a look at your pay stubs, your paycheck, and you will see a percentage of your income going through Medicaid, Medicare, and also to Social Security. So it turns out that the Social Security Trust Fund does generate a lot of money that it is at a surplus. And the money is basically sitting in there doing nothing. Now, the government is supposed to take the Social Security funds and invest it. But instead, what the government does is that they're using that money, meaning your money, and they lend it to other departments to finance their deficit spending, call it public schools, roads, Medicare, yada, yada. That's why you always hear in the street that the retirees from today and tomorrow are going to have a hard time because by the time they retire, either today or tomorrow, the Social Security Trust Fund doesn't have any money. The fund, it's broke because all the money available is loaned out to the other department. So if for whatever reason, if the U.S. defaults on the debt, meaning it doesn't pay the interest on the bonds and it doesn't pay the money back to the investors, retirees won't receive any type of Social Security benefits. OK, so before you start thinking about, oh, let me not worry about the Social Security. I don't really need those funds, so I should be OK. Hold that thought right there and let's move on to the left side of this tablet. But before we do that, if you're enjoying this episode, do not forget to hit the like button right here so you can help this episode rank and help others like you looking for information of this kind. So who is the public? Who is investing in the U.S. national debt? Well, very interesting. So we have insurance companies. So for those of you out there who own any life insurance, well, you know, be on the lookout. Uh, so private pensions are also invested in the U.S. national debt. Your retirement programs, such as your 401k, that's also invested in the U.S. national debt. Uh, and you have banks investing on the national debt with your savings. Huh? Interesting, right? And other investors include uh, foreign governors, right? So um, as I was doing my research, it turns out that Japan is the largest bond holder in the U.S., followed by China and the second place. Um, so Japan and China buys bond using the proceeds from their export. So it is Japan and China's way to loan their money back into the U.S. so that they continue to buy from their exports. Sound confusing, I know, but eventually it will make sense, right? And just so you know, Japan and China are not the only country owning the U.S. public debt. There's also the U.K., Ireland, Luxembourg, the Cayman Islands, Brazil. We have Taiwan, France, and Hong Kong. Aside from foreign countries, we also have the Fed investing in the national debt and also state and 
local governments. So if you thought that you didn't have to worry about social security because, hey, you have other investments, you have other savings, think twice because now, according to what you saw on the left side, um, you are heavily invested in the U.S. national debt, whether you like it or not, whether you knew about it or not, that's the sad truth, right? Because even your savings are invested in it. If you have a life insurance policy, that money, it's also investing in your pension, everything. So everyone is invested in the U.S. dollar. Every single one of them, your money is invested in the U.S. debt. And if the U.S. default, not only you will go down, but so does the rest of the world. And when will the U.S. default? We don't know that because that will highly depend on whether they want to raise the debt ceiling, right? Which is the maximum debt that a country can have. And as of the moment of this episode creation, the debt ceiling is currently set at slightly below $31.4 trillion. And for those who are curious, I actually found a website called uh, fiscaldata.treasury.gov for those who are curious to monitor the total amount of debt held by the public in the U.S. So it's right here. So as of March 7th, the date of this episode creation, um, this is the number. I'm not even going to try to read that out, but you kind of get the point as to where we are heading. Sounds very depressing, right? Well, let me tell you that the pressing about it is not going to do anything about it. Sadly, you have no control over what the government can do, what they choose to do, what they choose not to do. Yes, you can vote, but eventually you still have to worry about your neighbors or some of the people voting for a candidate of your choice. So long story short, it's out of your control. But the good news is that there's a lot you can do that is within your control, and that is choosing to manage your money the right way. And if you take action today, you will be able to take control of your life. It doesn't matter how young or how old, how close you are to retirement or how far away you are, you can take action today. And here's how. So there are three asset classes that you can invest your money in or you can park your money into to better protect your money for the future. And you can control it whichever way you want to control it. The first way to go about it is, of course, to invest in real estate. This is a channel about real estate education, right? And real estate is great because it is great to protect you and your money against inflation. Uh, it generates cash flow for you. So it's awesome because every month you're going to receive cash flow. And it also contributes to the health of the economy. Because when you're running a real estate business, you are providing housing, you are paying property taxes, and that in fact helps, you know, public services and stuff like that. And at the same time, you're creating job because when property taxes are collected, uh, roads get fixed, public schools get fixed. So you're actually helping create jobs for the teachers, for uh, everyone who's maintaining our roads. And at the same time, you also generate jobs on your end uh, in the event that you're doing any type of renovation. So uh, we're talking about contracting jobs, um, you know, anything that's related to the renovation or the upkeep of your property. Another option is to invest in your own business. It can't get any better than that, right? Because when you have your own company, you are creating jobs. Um, so you're helping the economy. Uh, you're contributing to the economy in other ways through payroll taxes. Once again, well, Social Security Trust Fund and all of that. You pay business taxes, etc. And then you're ensuring you get cash flow. And you're also bringing cash flow to your business, right? Another option you can do is to invest in precious metals particularly in gold and silver. In fact, just to show you a little bit of details here, at the time of this episode creation, an ounce of gold was going for $1,987.45, and an ounce of silver, it's going for $25.67. And that is how you take action to protect your money and protect your future. Now, for those who are looking to learn about investing in real estate, the right way, making sure that the property generates enough cash flow for you today. And also at retirement, here is a link for you to sign up to a free webinar where you can learn about the steps that I took 
to identify the right investment properties for me and how you can use the same approach to do the same for you. Take a look at the link. It's right here on the screen and also down in the description box below. I'll see you in the webinar. Take care. Bye-bye.